All right. Uh, I was thinking we could just begin with a short repetition of what we did in the previous lecture, <coughs> where we had a look uh, at a physical example of a system where we could use this method of Lagrange multipliers. So we had considered this uh, ring rolling down an inclined plane and used this method of Lagrange multipliers in order to obtain the uh, equations of motion for the system. So in this case, we had two generalized coordinates. We had x and theta. And We obtain, for instance, this equation for x, the position of the ring along the plane. And one point which I emphasized in the previous lecture, which I would like to emphasize once again, is that whenever you obtain a result, uh, for instance, an equation of motion or something which describes how the system evolves, such as this equation which describes the acceleration of the ring, you should always pause and consider, does this make sense? What does this, what does this mean physically? And we considered this in the previous lecture and saw that we had an extra factor of one half compared to the case uh, where the ring would simply be sliding down the plane. And we concluded that this one half was due to the fact that the ring was rolling. This was a constraint of the system. So the acceleration of the ring would be 50% or one half of the acceleration as if um, compared to the case when the ring was not rolling but simply sliding. So it's all, always useful to just take a moment and consider what does this mean physically, the equation that I just obtained? Does it make sense? And try to think about this instead of just mathematically, you know, driving on. And uh, although we derived this method of Lagrange multipliers for situations where we had non-holonomic systems. This example also illustrated that you can use the method of Lagrange multipliers even on a system where you have holonomic um, constraints. So to begin with today, I would like to summarize just a few of the uh, sort of key aspects of this variational principle that we've been discussing in several of the previous lectures. And sort of the, the main ingredient in terms of this variational principle has been to construct paths that the system can take between two specific points, um, which are varied compared to the actual or real path that the system will choose energetically. And we have quantified this, for instance, by means of these virtual displacements, del Q. And uh, one key aspect of this variational principle is that, that it's the most useful It's most useful when you can express 
the Lagrangian of the system through independent generalized coordinates for holonomic systems. This is the scenario we will be mainly concerned with in this course. But you now also have a tool in your arsenal of methods with which you can address non-holonomic problems, for instance, this Lagrangian multiplier method. Another important aspect of this variational principle is that it involves only the kinetic energy and the potential energy. These two quantities are physical quantities which have to be completely independent on the choice of coordinates. I can't choose two different coordinate systems and not end up with two different kinetic energies. It has to be the same. You can always choose a convenient reference system to express the kinetic energy as, uh, as simply as possible, but it's a physically invariant quantity with respect to which coordinate system you choose. So this is also handy. Now, there's one aspect of this variational principle which I haven't mentioned so far, um, but which I would like to go into some detail on today. And that is the following fact. Namely, the Lagrangian of a system is not uniquely defined. That's bad news, perhaps, you think? Um, because it means that we can choose between several Lagrangians which would describe the same system. So do we have some sort of ambiguity here in terms of which Lagrangian we should choose to describe the system? Well, don't be too concerned or worried about this fact. Um, in fact, you can consider it as an advantage because it means that you can have several available Lagrangians in order to describe the system. And this gives you a freedom in terms of choosing the most convenient one, in terms of physically understanding what's going on in the system. Uh, I think there's some exercise which, uh, in which you're supposed to prove this, that the equations most uh, are invariant if you make this substitution. But we can also see this immediately from Hamilton's principle. This is Hamilton's principle, which we use to derive uh, Lagrange's equations. So if you make this substitution now, 
I get this extra term due to this. Now, keep in mind that for a given system, we're always considering a path in which there are no variations at the end points, T1 and T2. So the integral of this is simply f, since this is a total time derivative of a function f, which means <coughs> that the result is just a variation of f at the two endpoints, which, as stated, is zero. So from this, it's obvious that we can always add a total time derivative of a function um, of the generalized coordinates and time, and still obtain the same physics, the same equations of motion. <coughs> so I wanted to illustrate this principle for you with a specific example. Right, so we're considering here a pendulum which is allowed to oscillate in the plane, but with a twist. The point at, wi at which it's attached, the pivot of this pendulum, is now allowed to vary with time. So this point where the pendulum is attached can now vary with time. So imagine it's driven, for instance, by an engine or something. Uh, and we consider just a point mass at the end of the pendulum with mass m. The rod has a length l. And the position of the pivot is given by y s. And it's a function of time. And we have gravity acting in this direction. All right. So the uh, first step, as always, write down the Lagrangian of the system. And as a precursory for doing so, it can be useful to express these coordinates, x and y, of the point mass at the end of the pendulum in terms of this angle, theta, and the position of the pivot, y, s of t. Okay, with these coordinates, we have vx, the velocity in x direction, We obtain the following simply by 
differentiating these coordinates with respect to time. And having done so, we can now easily write down the kinetic energy. So we see that compared to a scenario where the pendulum would simply be oscillating without any moving pivot, we would just get this um, angular velocity term. But due to the fact that the attachment point of the pendulum, ys, now varies with time, we have two additional terms. So you see that if ys dot, the time derivative of ys, if it vanishes, we just get this angular velocity term. Uh, and then we write down the potential energy. <coughs> Mgy. Uh, sorry. Uh, shouldn't the last term Gy be squared and added to the expression for t? Uh, let me see. Do you mean this term? Mm. And uh, then you get uh, y of the y squared. Yes. Um, plus the second term, but then we have a third term. Okay, so first we have this term, squared. Yeah. And then we square this entire parenthesis. So we get this one squared. Yeah. It's here. Then we get 2 times this times this. Or it cancels with the other. Exactly. This one squared combined with this one squared gives this one. Right. Yeah, no problem. And this is just the potential energy. And um, with this in hand, we're now in a position to write down the equations of motion because we know the Lagrangian. So by using Lagrange's equation on this Lagrangian, we obtain this equation of motion, which then determines how the angle here evolves with time. So keep in mind that ys, oops, ys of t is a known function. We assume that we know how this pivot moves with time. And so the only degree of freedom here is actually this angle. 
All right. So having obtained the equation of motion, this is the perfect time to just sit back for one second and have a look at this equation and see what it tells us physically. And to see this more easily, we can actually rewrite it just slightly. to this. All right. Does this seem reasonable? Why? Because we just add the acceleration. Right. We see that the effect of the moving pivot is simply to renormalize the gravitational acceleration, just as you say. And this seems rather intuitive. This seems reasonable. So the acceleration of this um, point mass is just renormalized by the acceleration of the pivot. Okay, it seems reasonable. We can move forward. Okay, now keep in mind that we just stated that the Lagrangian of a system is not, is not uniquely defined. We can always add a total time derivative of a function f, which is a function of q and t, and obtain the same physics, the same equations of motion. So having now identified sort of the physical um, content of this equation, One might suggest that this Lagrangian should give exactly the same physics. And the reason for this is as follows. If you disregard this y double dot term, this is just a Lagrangian for a pendulum without any moving pivot. But when analyzing the case with a moving pivot, we saw that the, the effect or the influence of this moving pivot was just to renormalize the gravitational constant, gravitational acceleration. And if this is the only physical effect it has, well, that should mean that if we write down the Lagrangian with just a renormalized gravitational acceleration, we should get the same physics. But note that this is different from the Lagrangian we actually derived um, over here. You see that T minus V, the Lagrangian here, is different from this one. But we still expect that they would give the same physics. So we call this L prime. So we give the same physics. And we now have a mathematical condition to test if this is actually the case. Namely, if the difference between L and L prime 
can be written as the total time derivative of a function f, then we know that they will give the same equations of motion and hence the same physics. Okay, so let's check. So that would be the difference between the two Lagrangians. Now for our purposes, there are two relevant terms here. This one and this one. These are the only terms that depend on theta and the time derivative of theta. These two terms depend only on time. And you can show that you can always add a pure function of time to the Lagrangian and still obtain the equa same equations of motion by a similar derivation as if you had a total time derivative of a function of both q and t. So since, since these terms only depend on time and not the generalized coordinate theta or its time derivative theta dot, we know they're irrelevant. So what we need to check is if these two terms can be written as a total time derivative. So the two purely time-dependent terms do not influence the equation of motion. So now let me introduce this function f, which is a function of the generalized coordinate theta and time. And it's given as minus ml y dot, y s dot, the time derivative of the position of the pivot, multiplied with the cosine of theta. We then see that the total time derivative of this function, which is equal to this, is exactly the two terms remaining in delta L. <laughs> 
So the main message here, the take home message, is that you can have two different Lagrangians which give exactly the same physics. The Lagrangian of the system is not uniquely defined. And the way we sort of showed this for this particular system was to first write down the equation of motion for the standard Lagrangian, the usual choice, T minus V. We obtained this. We then extracted a physical insight from this equation of motion, namely that the only effect of this moving pivot was to renormalize the acceleration. We took this and then intuitively wrote down this Lagrangian, which takes into account precisely this, a renormalized acceleration. And we then showed that the difference between these two Lagrangians can be written as the total time derivative of a function, and hence we know that they will give the same equations of motion and the same physics. So one question about the system here. Is it a conservative system? I see a shaking head. So why? So, because Y is time dependent, the energy of the system is not conserved. So whenever you have a time dependent, explicitly time dependent potential, for instance, in a system, you can think of this as someone, if you have the system here, someone sitting on the outside and injecting energy into the system. So it's obvious that the energy of the system will not be conserved. So this is a non-conservative system, but we can still use Lagrange's formalism. We are now going to move on to probably one of the most, if not the most central um, part of this course in conjunction with the Lagrange formalism, namely conservation laws and symmetries of a system. Now, Lagrange's equations So Lagrange's equations we know constitute n differential equations, one for each generalized coordinate. And each equation is a second order differential equation in time. So we need two n initial conditions. Uh, this often means 
this often means that we, we typically need the value of each generalized coordinate and the belonging velocity at, for instance, time equals zero, the start value of it. This would be two n initial conditions. Depending on the value of m, how large n is, this could be somewhat inconvenient. And actually, in some cases, um, we're not very much interested in the exact or complete solution of all the generalized coordinates, the exact time evolution of each qj. But instead, we're more interested in finding some way of characterizing the general properties of the system without going into the details for each Q. And this is where conservation laws and symmetries come into the picture. As soon as we're considering a system of point masses which are subject to a purely position dependent potential, V. So let's try to say something about the properties of this system in terms of the Lagrangian. So know that one term of the Lagrangian equation is the partial derivative of L with respect to x dot, or the generalized, the time derivative of the generalized coordinates. If the potential is purely position dependent, this term vanishes. So I'm just writing the total kinetic energy of the system like this, summing over all particles. I should use a different index here. And this is an important definition. 
So you see here that based on this uh, derivation we get that the partial derivative of L with respect to x dot is equal to m x dot, which is just the momentum, the mechanical momentum, P. So we define here, in a slightly more general way, the canonical, or also known as the conjugate, conjugated uh, momentum. Pi is equal to the partial derivative of L with respect to Qi dot. So we're basically associating a momentum, the canonical momentum Pi, with the generalized coordinate Qi. In this particular case, the canonical and the mechanical momentum are the same. However, if the potential is velocity dependent, the mechanical and the canonical momentum are not necessarily the same. Do we know any example of a situation where the potential is velocity dependent? Any ideas? Yes? Right. A particle moving in an electromagnetic field. Generalizing this to a situation where we have many particles, this would be the Lagrangian. You have the kinetic energy here, which should be a dot here. The kinetic energy here, and then the potential here. But keep in mind that for an electromagnetic field, this is not the potential energy, but this is the form the Lagrangian has to have to get the same form for the Lagrangian equation of motions equations of motion. And this was something we derived a couple of lectures ago, I think. Okay. So let's check what is the canonical momentum in the x direction, for instance, for particle i. We use its definition this is the definition which you can always use. Partial derivative of L with respect to the generalized coordinate xi. So the mo canonical momentum pi 
is associated with the generalized coordinate xi. And we get this. which is not equal to the mechanical momentum. So we'll take 15 minutes break.